Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and um, jumping on. Um, we're looking forward to a great evening to get lots of learning. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll definitely have plenty of time at the end for questions or answers. And if you have any um, things you just in the moment, you can always put something in the chat and we'll definitely save time for them to make this as interactive and ask all those pertinent questions for you that is relevant. Um, and just to give everyone a heads up, um, this is just part of our sports economics um, webinar series. Um, there's kind of given tidbits of information throughout this process. So you'll always be this lecture plus others will be uploaded um, to the AMSSM website, um, YouTube um, webpage, and definitely the reference it um, here or for later on. And also, in addition to this um, lecture here. Our next one in regards to sports economics will be coming up in the later months. It will be part, um, it'll be a panel of speakers. It'll be going over branding, marketing, and differentiation in the sports, uh, in the social um, media era. So definitely very um, relevant and very practical. But to go ahead and get started for today, um, I just want to introduce the main speaker for tonight. Um, that, that will be going over the wonderful world of um, billing, Dr. Michael Swartzen. Um, he and I am our CF New Beginner, so you need to have a little introduction about who's talking here. Um, I graduated from the University of North Carolina Sports to Medicine um, Primate Care Fellowship in 2019. I'm currently working in private practice um, in Norfolk, Virginia. And give me one second, I just gotta fix this screen here so I'm looking better and looking at you guys. Um, okay. So Dr. Swartzen is a board certified in sports medicine and family medicine physician at Baptist Health, South Florida. He completed his res residency at the University of Kansas Medical Center and fellowship um, at the University of New Mexico. Dr. Swartzen is an associate professor for Florida International University, as well as an affiliate professor for Nova Southeastern University and program director for Baptist Health primary care sports medicine fellowship program. He has extensive involvement in professional teams such as the Miami Dolphins, Florida Panthers, and has had prior experience um, covering jockeys at the Gulfstream Park. Even though I can go on and on regarding his accomplishments, I want to bring to light his wealth of knowledge in regards to billing. Even though he may not have received his desired understanding of billing at the time of fellowship, his self-education of billing has proven to be top-notch. His road to billing and coding unfortunately started from the missteps of just coding threes that introduced him to the frustration of an audit. However, this junction of, in life prompted him to learn billing and coding directly from CMS, Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services. He has continued to stay up to date by serving on the finance committee at his large healthcare system and serves as the physician champion of orthopedics in relation to billing and coding within the department. He has also published an article on the topic and has been extensively involved in AMSSM on educating others on the topic. So please sit back and enjoy the knowledge from Dr. Michael Swartzen. <laughs> there you go. Thank you for a uh, wonderful introduction. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. And let me know if that comes out well. Yep. Okay. Good. So uh, this is like the flight that if you're not on the right flight, now's the time to get off. So this is billing and coding basics for junior physicians and fellows in sports medicine. Um, as was mentioned, uh, I do have a particular passion about this topic. I have no disclosures whatsoever when it relates to billing and coding. So the first kind of talking about um, what our objectives are, just going over what the basics are, what, how did e &M start, what's the difference between medical decision-making and risk, how do you code procedures and other things, and then if we have any questions at the end, we can do some case-based examples. If you've had any interaction with physicians about coding or with auditors, 
think you've noticed that there's a little bit of uh, opinions that go one way or the other. Just like in medicine, where there's sometimes more than one way to do things, coding is not as cut and dry as you would think. There's a lot of nuances and not every expert agrees with each other. Things that some terms that we use, uh, CPT, ENM, and ICD, which is now in its 10th edition, uh, I've kind of listed what those definitions are. So starting with what is, what is coding? Because billing is really talking more about how much you bill an insurer or commercial payer for your services uh, asking for reimbursement. Coding is delineating what did you do during that visit to warrant the bill. So first thing is to talk about, and, and was mentioned before, the habit of many physicians is to just code a level three for everything and say, well, that's safe. And what happens is you'll have undercoding and that can mean a loss of revenue. So what does that look like? I have two numbers here. Uh, one is an RVU of what was before 2021, and the other is an RVU of what is now, and different healthcare systems are using different numbers. But if you were to see 20 patients a day uh, for 100 days, what the RVU value would be for uh, a 213, which is a low level visit, or what would it be for a moderate level visit? And you can see it's a substantial difference between what is a low level and what is a moderate level. Whether you're paid by RVUs or what those RVUs represent, which is uh, reimbursement for the code of the 99213 versus the 99214, the dollar value is relative to the RVU value. So you can be looking at a loss of about 30 to 35%. So medical necessity is one of the biggest, most important aspects of how you code. So I talked earlier just now about what a, a, a work RVU or relative value unit Long ago, they came up with a way of dividing how, how much your work is worth. If you think about it, so what goes into you seeing a patient? So the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid came up with three components for your work effort. So one is the actual time and intensity of the service, which includes your knowledge experience. Then there's a practice expense, keeping the light on, having the equipment, and then there's your malpractice to cover you for uh, any eventualities. Those three components, components make up an RVU. The WRVU is really concentrating more on what your component is. So if you own your own practice, obviously all three of those are relevant to you. If you are um, if you are just uh, an employed physician or academic, you, the work value may be the only one that applies. There are geographic modifiers, so certain areas in the country will have more or less. It is a definitely a complicated formula. I did not want to put the formula here. It does change every year for the most part. Uh, sometimes the dollar changes, sometimes the number changes. The next thing we got to talk about is, is the patient new or is it established? On the left, you can see these are the new patient codes for evaluation and management in an ambulatory setting. And on the right, you can see the established codes. The difference is the new code is for someone you've never seen or you haven't seen in three years. The complication results in if your partner has seen them, if someone in your department has seen them, if someone with the same tax ID who may be from a different specialty has seen them. You need to consult your own system as to how they want to decide whether that patient is new or established. And it can get even more complicated because one insurance payer may see your primary care sports medicine as a subspecialty and some of them may not. And so that would mean that another primary care physician 
seeing that same patient makes them an established patient for you. Even if you have a different specialty, you're seeing them under a different department for a different reason. So this is certainly something that in theory is someone that is new to you or you haven't seen in three years or maybe somewhat related to you in the healthcare system. As far as documentation goes, there are three main pieces. If you go back to medical school, when they would ask you to interview a patient, almost everything you did was related to the history. So the history, you have the chief complaint, you have the history of present illness review systems, their past family social history, and that is, that is a very specific way in which they judge that. The second part is the physical exam, and then the third part is the medical decision making. When you combine all three of those, that's what results in the proper ENM code for that visit. So looking into the first section, what is a history of present illness? These are the questions you ask routinely. Why are you here? When did it start? What have you taken? Have you tried anything? What makes it better? What makes it worse? All those questions that you ask that patient in regards to their complaint is considered the HPI and, they, and each one of those questions counts as a point. Anything more than, than four points is already considered an expanded HPI. So if you ask a patient basic stuff, you'll, you'll already hit that four points. Review systems and past family social history, I hope are self-explanatory, but sometimes there are some questions as to what exactly is a complete review systems. There are 14 systems. The eyes are not part of the ears, nose, mouth, and throat. These are all 14 systems. So I put them here for reference in case anyone needs to come back and screenshot this just so you see what a complete review of systems looks like. Because usually just saying complete review of systems does not suffice. Um, and it's not 12, there's 14. Physical exam. So when we started with all this, based on the 95 and 97 uh, exam guidelines, you either had a detailed exams or you had a comprehensive exam. Detailed exams for musculoskeletal were, were rather easy and straightforward. Comprehensive exams for orthopedics was extremely complicated. I'm listing here everything that would be required for a comprehensive exam. Again, just for your reference, so you have an idea what that actually looks like. So vitals, the constitutional, cardiovascular, you have to check lymph. You have to inspect or palpate four out of these six areas. You have to do the neuropsych part, which includes deep tendon reflexes and coordination, sensation, mental status, and you have to comment on their mood and affect. And you haven't really gotten to some of the MSK parts yet. Here comes the MSK parts. Now you have gait, you have inspection, and then when you do the exam on the body part, you have to examine four out of six body parts. Then there's the inspection of the other areas, and then range of motion, stability, muscle strength testing, special tests. Remember I said earlier that medical necessity plays a very key role in this evaluation process. So if someone came in with right knee pain and you evaluated the right knee as thoroughly as I mentioned above, and you said, well, for contralateral purposes, I'm going to check the left knee to see what normal is. I think that's a very reasonable thing. But where are you going to get two other body parts that it mentioned, right? If you check, they come in with knee pain and you're checking their head and neck or their spine or their right upper or left upper extremity, I would say, what is the medical necessity? What is the reason that you check that body part? 
If it's just so that you could fulfill documentation to bill at a higher level, then that does not qualify. Just doing the work does not give you the ability to code at a higher level. There must be medical necessity. Doctors seeing complex pediatric patients, patients with a trauma where you're evaluating multiple organs or multiple body parts, I think makes sense. But most of us in practice uh, don't typically see multiple musculoskeletal issues that would qualify for a comprehensive exam. Much more likely, you could do a 97 multi-system exam. This, if you look at it, looks like a typical general exam you would do. This is the, the 12 areas that you would need to evaluate. This is the level that you would need to look at it. If you were seeing someone for a general medical concern, these could be reasonable. Again, if someone came in with a problem that did not necessitate you looking at their ears, nose, mouth, and throat, and you documented that you look at it, and someone says, well, why did you check it? You said, well, just because. Again, that will not qualify. But for completeness sake of the basics of coding, I did list what a comprehensive 97 exam looks like. Now you come to the medical decision-making part. There are three parts to medical decision-making. There's the number of complexity of problems, which is in column A. There's the amount of the data that you reviewed in column B. And then there's the risk of complications in column C. You plug each one in and the highest two out of the three is what meets your level of medical decision-making. Now, why are we going through this? Because there's been plenty of webinars and seminars and lectures on coding. Well, in 2021, there was a complete revamp on evaluation and management in an ambulatory setting. So what was before a three-part series where you looked at the history, the physical exam, and medical decision-making, to make your correct code, history is gone, physical exam is gone, and now everything is related to medical decision making. So what do you mean it's gone? Where did it go? Obviously, you still have to take a history and a physical exam. They just stopped counting it as specific bullet points. So for right now, the standard is that you document what you deem is medically necessary for that patient. If it's two lines, that's fine. If it's 50 lines, that's fine too. Whatever you feel is appropriate for that patient and that encounter, that is up to you as a professional. So what else happened? Okay, so 95, they had these guidelines that were very vague. Two years later, they made guidelines that were much more specific with bullet points so people could follow along on what you did and what you didn't do. It changed a lot of how physicians had to document their notes. Many physicians liked having large paragraphs of HPIs and plans that were large paragraphs and people would dictate their notes. And once EMR came in and these rules came in and, and auditors started using bullet points, it changed a lot of how we write our note now. In 2021, the idea was to put the patient above documentation. This was trying to remove some of the burdens from physicians and others who document in the chart. So the first thing they said is, you can now code either based on time or based on just the medical decision-making. What we think is important is the mental work that you do that goes into the patient or the time you spend with the patient. Not only that, but before, time was almost limited to the face-to-face -face encounter that you had with the patient on that day. And they realized that we spend a lot of time working on our patients outside of the four office walls when you see the patient in the exam room. 
you are allowed to use any time that you spend on the patient, whether it's on the phone, reviewing their chart, and all of that time counts. It does not have to be 50% of the time coordinating their care like it used to be. What didn't happen in 2021? The codes for consultation, the inpatient code, and observation code are all still the same. You still have to use the 95 or 97 guidelines to meet those. Not everyone does consultation codes and not everyone practices in a hospital. This is more of a talk on basics. So I'm trying to update you on what's relevant today, but please realize this is not a comprehensive one size fits all approach. In 2021, they also made changes to the RVU value. They decided that physicians who practice in an ambulatory setting and see patients deserve to have some increase in their worth. In previously, almost all the higher numbers related to procedures and the surgical subspecialties. And there was very little placed on physicians who do preventative care and do more mental work. This was trying to improve that situation. If you look at how some of these office visits are increased, you could see that for the standard low-level follow-up visits or established patient visits, there's between a 28 and a 46% increase in the amount that you should be reimbursed, which is a very, very large increase that happened overnight. Certain hospital systems were not prepared for this. There's a lot of nuance to how physicians get paid. And some still use uh, the old numbers. Uh, and so I placed both of them here so you have some idea. This is the master, master sheet. If you did not know, the American Medical Association is the main group that works with the government to get codes approved, funding approved, and how coding takes place. It is a complicated process done by committee and there's hearings and there's comments and you should definitely be a part of that process if you can. But this is what resulted in all that since 1997 to 2001, this is the brand new chart. It's very difficult to read. It's a little light on specifics. And so there's a lot of gray area that was left in 2021 that we're still working on fixing. Luckily, uh, my healthcare system was kind enough to make something that seems a little bit more user-friendly, uh, color-coded. And if you look, it lists things a little bit more uh, concisely. So on the top, you have what is a straightforward visit in terms of time, and then it lists what the medical decision making is for the three components. So if you look at a level two visit, you could see the problem addressed, the data, and the risk. And remember, you need something that fits into two of those three categories. You do not need all three. Prior to this, for a new patient, you kind of needed almost everything. You can see what a level three, level four, and level five. The amount you need escalates as you go from two to five, and that is commiserate with the level of risk, the amount of work, or the time that you put in. As you put in more of that work and time, the higher the reimbursement value is. I hope this is kind of straightforward, um, but diving into more details, instead of going in through each level, one by one and trying to explain everything. I think the simplest way to do it is for me to go through what a level four visit is like, and then you can say, okay, well, did I meet this level of documentation and medical necessity and code of four, or did I not? And therefore you, you would code lower. On average for primary care, 50% of office visits are level four visits. That is a national average. So it's not specific to you or your healthcare system, 
But if you wanted to look at what a benchmark is, about 50% of your office visits around there should be level four visits. The documentation for time should be very specific. So now patients have access to their chart. They code a lot in, in they, they have access to their EMR. They ask for their records. If you code based on time and you said, I spent 52 minutes with this patient and the patient reads that and says, what are you talking about? You were in the room for maybe five minutes. It would look much better if you spent time and put in your note exactly what you did during that time. So not only does it help an auditor know what you did, but it also informs the patient of the amount of work you did on their behalf that may not have been a part of the face-to-face -face communication. So if you reviewed their chart, if you talked to another doctor, if you called radiology, if you spent time talking to the physical therapist or going over what their future labs are, anything you did on that day, even if the EMR was difficult and you had to spend 10 extra minutes writing their note, all of that time now counts towards the total time spent on that patient. And as long as you document it, it's completely fair. You cannot count any time you spend traveling to the patient or on the patient's behalf. If you have a medical student resident or fellow, you cannot count the teaching time that you spent. And if you do perform a procedure, the time spent performing that procedure is not considered fair game at all for uh, a time-based visit. Let's look more in depth at what the medical decision-making would look like for a level four visit. So on the problem side, two stable chronic problems. Someone comes in for follow-up for right knee arthritis and left shoulder impingement syndrome that's been going on for four weeks or one chronic illness with an exacerbation, progression, or side effect of treatment. It can be any of those three. Again, using my knee arthritis example, someone's had knee arthritis for three years, they went hiking, now their knee's swollen, they're coming in the office complaining of pain. That would be a chronic illness with an exacerbation. If for some reason you got an x-ray and it looks worse, you could also call it a progression. Doesn't matter. Uh, that fits that particular um, category. An undiagnosed new problem with an uncertain prognosis. A mass you find on their arm or on their elbow or some bone lesion you see on x-ray. Something that you know that it's not great, but you don't know exactly what it is and you're going to work them up to find out. An acute illness with systemic symptoms. Uh, COVID would be a good example. Mono, other illnesses that would result in systemic symptoms. Uh, you could uh, um, put many of the medical issues here. Things that would be uh, not systemic, uh, a simple UTI or cystitis would not be considered an acute illness with systemic symptoms but pyelonephritis would. An acute complicated injury, I want you to think of an ACL tear, uh, something significant where you do not expect them to recover completely with simple measures. The data category. Again, you could read each one of these and try and understand you need three in category one to qualify. And those can be additive. So if they come in with notes from the urgent care and they come in with notes from a doctor they saw three years ago and they came in with an x-ray from an outside place that you look at the result, those would be three points that you could use that would meet the moderate level of decision making on the data point. Independent interpretation of tests. So they brought, they went to urgent care, they got an x-ray, you're looking at that x-ray yourself and you say, okay, I'm looking at this D 
and it has an effusion with mild knee arthritis. If you put in the note that you independently reviewed that x-ray and you saw medial joint space narrowing and a suprapatellar effusion, that would qualify as an independent interpretation. You have to look at it yourself and you have to document that you looked at it. And more importantly, you have to say something about that image. You cannot use this for images for stuff you do in the office in-house that you charge for separately. So if you have an in-house x-ray, you cannot charge for the x-ray, the x-ray report, and then use you viewing that x-ray as part of an independent interpretation for this data section. They really don't like double dipping for coding. The third, which is probably one of the more common situations, is you discuss this with another physician. Think about a patient that came in with an ACL tear and you called one of the sports surgeons and said, listen, I got this person from uh, uh, Blank University and I think they got an ACL tear. I'm sending them to get an MRI. Would you see them? Um, you see an x-ray. You're not sure what it looks like. You decide to call radiology and you have radiology review the case with you. Anything that is from a physician that is not directly related to your office and you're talking to them about that patient, this would qualify. So that would automatically put this in the moderate level for the data point. Risk is, is another one that can be complicated. So some things are very simple. Prescription drug management means any time you start, change, or stop a medication. If you prescribe anything and you document that you prescribe it, that qualifies. If they came in on muscle relaxers and you said, listen, Mr. Smith, I don't think you need to be on the muscle relaxers anymore, and you say discontinue muscle relaxers, that counts as a moderate level. Decision for minor surgery with risk factors and major surgery, that usually doesn't fall under the primary care sports medicine uh, umbrella. But if you do have a patient that you end up spending some time talking about surgery, uh, a knee replacement, a knee scope, then and they decide based on your discussion with them that that's what they want to do, then that would qualify. Even if you're not the surgeon, having the discussion and having that decision made does qualify with the risk. Social, social detriments of health. Uh, what would that look like? You, someone comes into your office with calf swelling. They say, listen, I have a concern that you have a, a blood clot in your leg. I'd like you to go over to the imaging center or the hospital to get evaluated for a blood clot. And they tell you, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't have the insurance that could let me go to the hospital and I don't want to be stuck with the bill. You can explain to us that this is your health, it's important, but if in the end they choose to not follow your recommendation because of an insurance or financial issue, then that qualifies raising the risk of that visit to a moderate level visit based on risk. time visits. I wanted to list uh, what the centers of Medicare and Medicaid think are appropriate. This is not an all-inclusive list, but just to give you an idea of things that you may spend time on, on a patient, where it could qualify based on time. Imagine if your note could be so simple that all you did is said, patient is here for right knee pain. You, you did a three-line exam and you put, I spent 20 minutes with the patient and these are the things I did, your note is done. You don't need anything else. Now you may want other things because you think it's necessary, but from a, a medical necessity of what your documentation has for billing and coding, these are the things that uh, they find relevant. Again, I may go through this slide quickly because we need to move on, but I'm leaving it on here so that um, someone can screenshot it if necessary. Telehealth is huge. 
Uh, initially, there were almost no restrictions because this is the only way we could see patients from uh, April, May of 2020. They did extend it to the end of 2023. So you are still safe to use it this year and next year. I would check with your state and I would also check with different commercial payers. Some of them have stopped covering this and they don't tell you and they don't tell the patient and all of a sudden they start getting bills, which is a very unfortunate situation. Hopefully uh, different states are, are handling this. I know Florida just passed it. Uh, I can't speak for the other 49 states and the territories. Um, there are numerous exceptions. A lot of patients want audio only because the video component is difficult. And I've seen that personally with some of my patients, old or young, internet access, device failures. Uh, it sucks when you have to cancel an office visit, even though you can hear them well, but you can't see them. Attestations. So if you are a resident fellow, you've probably seen all these that you're attending put in. Here are a couple examples of things that may be relevant to you very soon. One is if you're working with a scribe or someone else, again, the statement that I have here is probably conservative and has more than you need. But I figure in a, in a lecture like this, it'd be better for me to give you more and you can cut back what you don't feel is necessary. There are some guidelines for teaching. There's, there's less leeway with teaching than with uh, any scribe station. Gone to the procedures. Now you wanna start doing diagnostic ultrasounds in clinic. You have this fancy machine, you're enjoying doing it, but how do you get paid to do this in clinic? You may be competent in doing it, but how do you get paid for your work? There are two main codes. One is for a complete exam, one is for a limited exam. It's a little complicated which one you choose. For the shoulder, it is always complete you always have to use a complete exam. For most other body parts, if you look at a specific area with thoroughness, it usually counts as complete. However, if you're only looking at one specific thing, Achilles tendon, patellar tendon, all you do is put the probe on one area, that certainly seems more like a limited exam. Just like with x-rays, you have to specify which side and why you're doing the ultrasound. The reason is very critical. It can be pain, but you have to list it. You have to write a written report and you have to keep the images in case the auditor wants to see what you did. What about procedures? So procedures are considered a separate entity from the evaluation and management. If you decide to do a procedure in the office, there's First you have your visit, and then you have your procedure. It's almost like you walk out and you walk back in, and it is a separate process. If it is so fluid that it is the same, then you could end up having some issues getting the evaluation and management code approved. There are some modifiers for bilateral or multiple procedures. What is a 59 modifier for a multiple procedure? If you were to do a right knee injection and then had to do a right hip or a right shoulder injection, those codes are the same codes. If you don't put a modifier on that code, how is an insurance company supposed to know that you didn't accidentally double code the same thing? The way we show that is we say, okay, one is a 20611 right for the knee and then a 2061159 for the shoulder. And that way they know that you purposely put the same code twice. There are some codes that have ultrasound included and there are some that do not. This is about uh, eight years old or so. Uh, it's working well for most people, but there's small, intermediate and large joints or bursas. On the left is the code without ultrasound and on the right is the code with ultrasound. 
I also included the RVUs so you see what doing the ultrasound adds as far as your work and your reimbursement. There are some unbundled ultrasound codes. So tendons, ligaments, ganglion cysts, hematomas, anything that's more nerve related, carpal tunnel, Morton's neuroma, uh, you put one of those codes and you add the 76942. That is telling the insurance company that you used ultrasound to do this injection and you have to specify why. It really, it's important for you to specify why did you add this particular service uh, and whether it's to avoid vascular injury uh, or because the patient's body habitus didn't let you see it or you wanted to find uh, a specific area of the tendon that had damage, all those can be valid. The most important ways to know is why did you use it? And if it's to see, well, then you need to put that you needed to see to do a good job. Fracture care uh, can be very helpful for those of you who see this often. Fractures are treated like surgery, even if it's a closed reduction in the office, even if you're doing no reduction, if it's just management, it is part of a 90 day global. So once you code that fracture care, you every time you see that patient for the next 90 days, it's included in part of that first visit. So yes, you may get a larger sum in the beginning, but you can see that it's possible for you not to get ahead if you're seeing that patient often. Uh, X-rays are not included, casting supplies are not included. Here are some casting codes, splints. Uh, you cannot, again, going back to the double dipping, you cannot code for removing a cast that you put on. They do not want you removing the cast and putting a new cast every week just to charge the patient money. If you have to do it because the cast smells, it's just one of those things that you have to do for the patient. And as I mentioned before, if it's a complicated fracture that you may be seeing them every week or every two weeks for a couple months, it may make more sense for you to bill uh, regular evaluation and management visits rather than under fracture care. There's some modifiers we mentioned. So 25 is for the procedures. If you are seeing someone in a global period, uh, you can put 24 modifier if not only do they come in for their hand fracture follow-up, but now their shoulder hurts because of how they're using their hand and you need to address that separately, that could be considered. Um, again, here we mentioned some of these other modifiers. Some of you may do chronic exertional compartment syndrome. This is not a very lucrative uh, item, but the billing is very specific. I wanted to put uh, on the slide what that looks like exactly. If you have athletic trainers in your clinic, physical therapists in your clinic, other healthcare professionals that are able to do other education with patients, sometimes you can charge for those. For example, if you have a patient come in and they have I keep using knee arthritis, but let's say they have knee arthritis and you explain to them how important the biomechanics are of the knee and optimizing it and that they need to improve their quad strength. And they say, well, how do I do that? I say, well, you know, I'll send you to physical therapy. And they say, well, I don't have time to go to physical therapy. At least they're honest with you, but how do you solve that problem? Because you may not have the 20 minutes it would take to sit with them. But if you have an athletic trainer or someone else qualified in your office, you can have them do the instruction and you put in the note that the patient was instructed for X amount of minutes, the minimum is 15, on some therapeutic exercise, whether it's for a frozen shoulder, whether it's for an ankle sprain, it doesn't matter. You document what you did and there's a code for it. If you need to instruct them on how to use a brace or how to 
walk with crutches. There's another code for that as far as gait training. Some take home points. There's a lot that we went over. It's not expected that you know everything right away. Mistakes are made routinely. I do not get 100% on my audits. But when I don't get 100%, I go back to the auditor and we review everything. Sometimes they miss something and I'm correct. And sometimes I didn't realize that I saw the patient two years ago and I billed them as a new patient. Mistakes happen. No one is suggesting that there's fraud or any impropriety. So try not to take offense when you're reviewing these cases. If you end up in a busy practice seeing dozens of patients a day, you will end up coding thousands a year, thousands and thousands over years of your career. It's important that you try and spend some time early on going case by case, trying to learn this. I'm telling you, this is how I did it and it worked really well for me. And I'm happy to help everyone else, but I won't be there with you for every patient you see. So going through these, it may be painful you know, in the beginning, but hopefully in the beginning of your practice, you may not be as busy or in fellowship, you'll have other people that you can ask and you go through case by case to find what works well for that particular case. And you can start picking up the nuances. Most of the patients we see are very similar from day to day. And so a pattern will emerge and you will learn and then there'll be more nuances for you to learn. So my advice is to go through each patient, make sure you document everything you do truthfully. This is not copy paste and do not pay attention to the details. If you are billing based on those details and they are not what you did, then that would be considered fraud and you can be in a lot of trouble for that. You wanna make sure that whatever you document, if you're coding based on that documentation, it has to meet medical necessity. If another doctor were to sit down with you and say, did you have to do this? And you say, no, I didn't, then that would not meet medical necessity. So I would just challenge you to ask yourself, is this medically necessary? In most cases, you can come up with very reasonable explanations as to, yes, it is medically necessary for me to check this particular thing because of blank. But think about it. And if you need to do it, then do it and document that you did it. And then you will code properly. And that could lead to a very healthy career for you because most of us didn't get into this for financial gain. But having that financial freedom and allowing us to either build our family or take care of a practice is very important. And this all comes down to how you bill and code correctly. So I, I wanted to thank you very much for your time. Uh, this is the basics talk. So everything kind of went over very quickly. I did put in uh, my email here in the last slide. I have a picture of my partners here in Miami and I couldn't do what I do without them and my family for their support. And hopefully there's still a few minutes for questions if we have any. Yes, thank you so much. That was definitely very helpful. Um, and we do um, have a few questions um, that came up in the chat. One of them, let's see, is a question. If billing is based on time, do you need to provide the specific number of minutes spent? Or can you put a range? For example, if the 99214, can you say between 30 and 39? you have to put a specific amount. The range is what they give you to, to let you know where you put the, uh, what code you put. Think about the preventative services code. It's 18 to 39. You can't say, I saw an 18 to 39 year old male today. You have to put their age. So the, the timing has to be very specific. And once you have that, then you know exactly which one to, to put uh, as far as which code range you fit into. Okay, great. Um, another question is, can you do fracture billing if you are taking over management 
after the initial diagnosis and splint placement by an ED or an urgent care? Yes. If it is from an ED or an urgent care, yes, you can. If it is from a partner or you plan on sending it to one of your partners, please be very careful, right? So if you're seeing a patient and you see this patellar fracture and you say, gee, you know, I think this might do better with surgery, you should not be billing for fracture care and then referring for a surgical consultation for that same fracture. That would not be appropriate uh, and will lead to billing issues down the road. Okay, um, another question is we have uh, from one is, we've had difficulty getting reimbursed for gait training and exercise teaching from our ATC being told they're specifically physical therapy code, codes. Um, yes, so almost everything that I mentioned is subject to denial. And you could see a patient and they say, no, that patient is new. No, that patient is established and they deny. In this particular case, it depends a lot on the state you're in, how athletic trainers are licensed. I believe in the state of California, they're not licensed at all. So how do you bill for something from a licensed healthcare professional if they're not licensed? Certainly the insurance is not going to recognize that. It is a physical therapy code. That's true. And in, in some states, you can use athletic trainers as physical therapists. And remember, many times they're billing for work under you. So if you're there, sometimes that qualifies as sufficient. However, many of this will be dependent on the payer. What I'm giving you is the basics. And again, I don't like using names of insurance companies, but you know, insurance company X, Y, and Z may pay and then insurance A may deny it. And they may pay for it today and not pay for it tomorrow and it'll drive you crazy. But unfortunately, until we go through some single payer system, you will be at their mercy. And of course they tell you 120 days later and then you have to go and figure it out. And again, go back to your documentation and hope it was accurate enough. Yeah, I'm just going to add two cents to that. Um, for me, just going literally categorize which insurances pay, which insurances don't. It really helps you fine tune. Is it globally in a state thing or versus insurance space? And going to y'all's contracts if you're a um, smaller practice to see if it's covered. But another question is here. If a surgical colleague refers a patient strictly for an ultrasound guided procedure, most commonly a hip injection in this particular person's practice, my organization is telling me I cannot bill an e &M along with the procedure code with the justification that a procedure code has a built-in e evaluation management component already. So technically they are correct. The procedure code carries a, a lot with it. It carries the e &M portion, which means that any discussion you have on risks and benefits, it carries the medication component. So if you're injecting a steroid or something that is a prescribed medication, you could say, well, this is a prescribed medication, so that makes it a moderate level visit. If it's a part of the injection, then no, it, it goes all through the injection. What I would challenge that organization is in cases where patients are complicated. So I may get an injection from one of my partners but the injection is not accurate to what that patient has, right? That person referring the patient to me might say hip injection, and then I'm looking at the x-rays and I'm looking at an MRI and I say, well, you know, you came in for a hip joint injection, but I think this is really more your, your glutes or your bursa. And we have this exam and evaluate where exactly is the pain. And it's almost like you're starting over if you can show that you had to redo everything to make sure that you got the right procedure, you can make an argument that there was a separate evaluation. However, if the patient came in for an intraarticular hip injection and you did an intraarticular hip injection, it's very unlikely that they will allow a separate code 
uh, for some insurance companies. It, that, so that is true. Um, and, and I would say that you should probably think about that as you're going in and when you're discussing with the patient so that when, you, when your partners refer to you, that they've kind of prepped the patient because you shouldn't be looking and doing their exam and doing everything over again. Obviously, I want you to do anything you feel comfortable, uh, you have to do to feel comfortable doing a procedure, but you won't be paid for that separate evaluation and management if it's that straightforward. Okay, great. Um, the next one is, if you ha ask a colleague to do a quick ultrasound scan, but it's not enough to bill a limited ultrasound exam, can that increase the level of billing? Can it be considered as reviewing images? I, I don't know how you could do an ultrasound in a way that wouldn't even meet limited um, because you really don't need much to qualify. Um, if you feel that it was medically necessary to do that ultrasound, then certainly I would, I would bill for that. If in the eventuality that you decided that you didn't want to bill for it, um, but that you use the information from reviewing the images, I do think you could use that. But remember, are you using it reviewing the images as far as just getting the information, which would only be worth one point in the data category? Or are you using it as an independent uh, visualization of an image that was saved and is attached to the patient's chart that would be worth a moderate level on its own. Um, I think in these cases where it's like a curbside consult, do a quick scan, uh, I think it's definitely for the patient's benefit. It's learning for everyone involved. Uh, but a lot of times if you're doing it in this manner, like if I have my fellow do an exam on someone, it's, it's not common for me to, to bill for it if we were just looking for practice or looking for just something random. Um, but there are cases where it is worth documenting and therefore you can get credit for the diagnostic part. I don't think you can really use the images part. Um, the last one we have up here is, um, I've been told that if a PA is sending to an MD within the same practice, this can be billed as a new rather than an established uh, patient since it's a higher level of care. Is this correct? Um, you know, I don't work with PAs that often in my tax ID number, so I have not uh, I have not seen this come up specifically. The rule is that you are the same tax ID and the same specialty. And considering that there's no PA that's a primary care sports medicine, I, I would always bill someone coming from a PA in our group, whether it's from ortho or primary care as new, simply because they're, they're not the same specialty. Uh, I'm sure there may be a discrepancy with one or two of the insurance companies, but overall, uh, I would say that anything coming from a PA should be new, but your healthcare system, for one reason or another, may feel otherwise. All right. All right, and I know time's coming short, so we'll just kind of have to kind of wrap it up soon, but looks like there's uh, another question that came up says, if a patient is returning for their, uh, for their every 90-ish day cortisone injection for their knee osteoarthritis, is it just a procedure code or can it be an ENM plus procedure? Okay, so if you ask me or if you ask some of the coders in my hospital, you would get a different answer. And I think it all comes down to the details. What did your last note say? If your last note, the plan was, follow up in 90 days for a repeat injection as needed, then no, you could not charge a separate ENM code for that visit. If they came in and you said, well, it's been, you know, 90 days is a little short, but 
let's say it's been a, a year and they said, well, really, I came in for another injection. You say, well, hold on a moment. We haven't seen you in a year. Let's get an x-ray. Let's do an exam. Let's see where you're at. And you go through uh, the diagnosis and you go through their options. You say, listen, you know, you should probably lose weight, do therapy. Have you considered a, a knee replacement or a brace? So if you start going through another evaluation to determine uh, why they're having their exacerbation or if there's a progression, then I do think it's warranted to do the separate ENM and then a 25 modifier for the injection. But if you're having patients come in and I have them, they come in like clockwork, they come in, I need my shot. They're just talking to you about their family and their day and they're laying on the table ready for the shot. I, I would not charge for an ENM visit for that. That is just very straightforward um, injection. But what I do find in a lot of those patients is they have more than one problem. And if any of those problems do get discussed, then you can put the evaluation and management on those diagnoses and then just the procedure for the knee. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Schwartz, and thank you everybody for coming out. I know there's always more questions, more tidbits to be learned because so much as you get into practice, you just learn um, stuff is denied, approved, and all these intricacies. Um, but just a reminder, um, there is the, our next le lecture part of sports um, economics is coming up. Actually, it's going to be in May after the AMS system conference. And again, it's going to be um, Dr. Georgia, oh, excuse me, Dr. Jordan. Metzl, um, excuse me, on differentiation and branding and marketing um, in a social media era. So it definitely would be very beneficial. They will be recorded and we look forward to seeing you at the conference and at that next um, webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for your time.